Does anybody here like the outdoors? What about survival shows? Yeah, okay, sure. I like that. sure. <laughs> no, when I was a freshman in high school, I had one of our football coaches become our biology teacher. And it may come as a massive shock to you, but this football coach had zero interest in actually teaching us biology. And so one day he got the bright idea that he would go on Amazon and order an episode of Man vs. Wild, and he would play it for us that day, and he would teach us about the plant life that was all in the jungle in that episode. The problem with this great plan that he had was that instead of buying one episode, he accidentally bought three whole seasons of Man vs. Wild. And so for an entire semester of freshman biology, I spent almost every single day in class watching Bear Grylls navigate these harsh environments. Now, I gotta be honest with you, I know it's fake. I know that, that Bear Grylls wasn't out there really camping in the Amazon for five days straight. I know that every day they'd get done filming and he'd probably go back to his comfy hotel and probably eat pizza. But the show was still captivating and it was still so interesting to see all the different skills that he taught for survival. And if we're being real, the dude earned it. I mean, he was a member of the military for the British Special Forces. So he knew what he was talking about. And he had an audience of millions of people that he taught with skills how you could not just survive a harsh environment, but actually thrive in it. So naturally, when I became a student pastor in Georgia, I had to put those skills to the test. And so what I did was I took some of my high school boys one day and we decided that we were gonna go backcountry camping. And if you don't know what that is, backcountry camping is where you take a backpack and you pack it with everything you need, including firewood, anything, and then you go hike through the woods for miles and camp. So we loaded up in cars, we headed to this canyon in the middle of Georgia that was surrounded by woods, and y'all, man, we survived the elements, we conquered the night. I'm talking, we went out there, we hiked for miles, we built fires, we cooked our own food. Now, we didn't forage for grub worms under tree bark like Bear Grylls might have done, but we did eat the American camping classic, Beanie Weenies, roasted over fire. And then we also climbed through different, uh, different environments and terrains, and we even managed to navigate our way through an unmarked trail. And so we came, uh, by the end of the day, we ended up capping off that event by hiking through the canyon and just enjoying the different sights and climbing through. And this is actually one of the last pictures we took from that trip. Yeah, there they are. And uh, I love this story and this, this, this memory for me because it was one of my favorite bonding experiences with some of my high school boys. But I also loved it because, man, we just, we weren't afraid of the challenge of backcountry camping. We went out there, we conquered that canyon, and we thrived in a harsh environment. Well, we're continuing our series, Thriving in Babylon, today. And what we're doing is taking some time to walk through some really important moments in the Old Testament book of Daniel. And this book is a great book that teaches us how we can not just survive, but thrive in a hostile environment. And today, we're going to take a look at the story of Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they face King Nebuchadnezzar in the fiery furnace. And these are great people to learn from because they lived in a hostile environment. They knew what it was like to be an exile in a foreign world. And so their story is one that we can learn from if we want to learn to thrive in a world that's different from us. And so as we study their story this morning, the main point I want to focus on with you today is that God turns the hostile into the hospitable. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can turn to Daniel 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. And we'll start by looking at verses 1 through 3 together. So King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide, or six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up, and they stood before it. So we start off this chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar has built this golden idol. But it's important for us to understand the context of where this statue comes from. Just one chapter back in Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he wants it interpreted. No one in the land is able to interpret that dream but Daniel. So Daniel meets with him, talks about the dream, and what he tells Nebuchadnezzar is that ultimately his kingdom wasn't eternal, that Nebuchadnezzar would die, his kingdom would fade away, and other kings and kingdoms would come and go. 
But ultimately, it would be God who would establish an eternal kingdom that would last forever. And in response to this, Nebuchadnezzar actually praises Daniel and God. But it's not true worship. Because not only does he try to worship Daniel, but his worship to God is actually very short-lived. Because as we start our chapter in chapter 3, you actually see that Nebuchadnezzar has let pride go to his head. And he's decided that after dreaming about a golden statue, he's going to build one. And so he builds this statue, and it's about 90 feet tall, and he commands all of the people to worship this in his name and in the names of his gods. And so this idol is not some small statue tucked away in the back of a vast temple full of gods. This is kind of the equivalent of someone telling you that you had to worship the Washington Monument. And so it's a big deal. And he calls on all of his officials to gather for the dedication of this idol and the worship of it. And this is likely a test of allegiance to his officials. Now, it's important to note that Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would have had to have been present at this because one of the outcomes of Daniel interpreting the dream in Daniel 2 is that his friends actually get appointed to be administrators over the province of Babylon. And so as Nebuchadnezzar prepares to test his subjects and officials for their loyalty, he'd be testing these three friends as well. So let's keep looking at verses four through seven and see what happens next. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this is really a big deal. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't think this is some small moment. He's gathered a large band. He's gathered all of his people. And at the decree, when the sound would go off, they were to worship. And he says that whoever does not worship, it does not matter who they are. If they don't worship, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. And if you heard Nebuchadnezzar say this, you would know to take it seriously because historically, Nebuchadnezzar was known as a man of justice. And so what that meant was that he took laws incredibly seriously. And so when he would create laws and rules, he would zealously fulfill them and their punishments if necessary. And so you would know that this was not a decree to be taken lightly. And this had to have been a shocking turn of events for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because, I mean, think about the life they've had in exile so far. It's been pretty good, right? I mean, they're appointed as officials over this city, and life is seemingly going pretty well. But now, all of a sudden, you're faced with the idea of worship this idol or die by fire. And this would have been a reality check for Daniel's friends, that they quickly realize again that they're in a hostile environment, even though they've experienced some success as followers of God in Babylon. And this is also an important reality check that we need to make for ourselves as well, that we need to recognize and understand that the church exists within a hostile environment, and we need to understand what all that entails. And when I say this, I'm not just talking about America. Really, it's that the whole world isn't conducive of Christianity. Jesus actually talked about it with his disciples in John 15, 18 through 19. He said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And that is why the world hates you. So if the world hated Jesus all throughout his life and ministry, the world will hate us too if we're followers of Jesus. And so it shouldn't shock you when our culture denounces or attacks Christianity in any way. But we also need to understand how exactly it is that our culture attacks Christianity because it's very similar to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced in Babylon. See, when you think about the environment they were in, the nation of Babylon was a polytheistic society. And what this meant was that they worshiped multiple gods. And so when Nebuchadnezzar makes the decree to worship this idol, He's not saying that the Hebrews are supposed to stop worshiping Yahweh. They just have to worship his gods as well. Because you have to remember that Nebuchadnezzar, at least to some degree, does respect God. He has some sort of reverence for God, but it's not the same level of devotion and reverence and fear that the Hebrews had. And so even though he has respect for God's power, he still commands 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to worship this idol. And our culture very much pressures us in the same way. See, our culture doesn't really care if we worship Jesus and follow Jesus, right? Because for a lot of our culture, they respect Jesus, at least as a humanitarian. But they don't believe that he's God, and they certainly don't like all of his teachings. And so what they try to do in response to this then is change or add to the parameters of our faith. And so what they'll do is they'll say, look, you can worship your God, but you better be okay with us killing babies. You can worship your God, follow your Jesus, but you better accept sinful lifestyles as good and beautiful things. You you can worship your God, it's okay, but you better accept that other religions are different pathways to the same destination. You can worship your God, worship your Jesus, but you better recognize and accept that I can be the Lord over my own life and you can't tell me what to do. And so our culture will tell you that it tolerates Christianity. Our culture will tell you that they love Jesus. But make no mistake, our culture will never accept a Christianity that promotes Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Our culture, this world, will constantly push back against the message of faith and repentance just as it has throughout all of history. And so it shouldn't come as a shock to us. But this doesn't mean that the church needs to change its message. And it doesn't mean that the church is doomed. But this is an area that I think many of us need to grow in. Because I think so often we look at events like prayer being taken out of schools or anti-Christian protests or the use of satanic imagery and music as these shocking attacks on our faith. And if we're not careful, we begin to get into this mindset that there's no way Christians or God's church could ever grow and or thrive in the environment that we find ourselves in today. And I see this often with parents in particular. Now, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've heard how our culture is ruining our children. But if you're a parent in the room, can I be brutally honest with you for a second? You've gotta stop relying on a broken world to teach your children to live a godly life. Yeah, but but to rely on our schools and our government and our culture and media to produce godly fruit in your children It's fighting a losing battle. This is a hostile environment. And so if you want your children to live godly lives, a little tough love here, you gotta stop commenting on Facebook about how bad our world's gotten and you've gotta set the example for them. And so it means that you've gotta make faith a priority for your children. You make church a priority. Show them what it looks like to serve God and serve others. Show them that they can have the ability in Christ to live in a way that is different from the world around them. Show them that they can thrive in Babylon. See, the reality for all of us is that we're exiles in a foreign, hostile world. But God turns the hostile into the hospitable. All throughout history, especially when you look at the New Testament of the Bible, you can see that God doesn't just sustain his church and his people, but he grew his kingdom in miraculous ways and his grace and his mercy radically changed the lives of Christians despite the environment that they found themselves in. And so for us, we need to understand and recognize that the environment that we find ourselves in today, it's not a setback for the church. It's par for the course. And so we have to make a choice. We can either panic and stress about the world we live in and just try to survive it, or we can make the choice to thrive in this world by living out the example that Jesus set for us through his life and his teaching. And Jesus actually talked about this a little bit with his disciples in John 16, He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace because in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So is our world evil? Absolutely. Are you going to face all kinds of trouble and trials and persecution throughout your life? Yes. But nothing in this world can stop Jesus. Living in a hostile environment, it's not gonna ruin your children. It won't destroy your faith and it won't stop God's kingdom because he's already overcome the world. 
And so if we are faithful to follow God and keep his commands and grow in our faith, he is faithful to turn the hostile into the hospitable and help us to thrive in any situation we find ourselves in. So we understand the environment we're in, and we also understand that we can thrive in the environment that we're in. But how do we respond to our world? Well, let's keep reading with verses 8 through 12. It says that this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, that is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. So Nebuchadnezzar issues this decree that everyone is to worship this idol. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they make the choice to not worship. But I want you to pay attention to how they respond to this decree. Because the only reason that we know that they didn't do it is someone tattled on them. And so here's what that tells us. This, this wasn't some public grand display of defiance. There was no lofty speech. There was no courtyard gatherings about how the decree of Nebuchadnezzar was this tyrannical issue. But they also don't do it in secret. They don't hide what they do in the issue of the decree. They just don't do it. They knew that worshiping this idol and serving the gods of Babylon went against everything they believe. And they decided to make this decision in public to not worship, knowing that they could face death as a result. And see, this is an important example for us to follow as well. Because I think we have the need to fight against our culture. And in a lot of ways, I say, that's awesome. That's a good thing, right? Because we should fight against the pressure of our society to conform to the world, and we should live obediently to God. And we should fight against big issues like abortion and racial injustice. But the issue is, is that so often we fight the wrong fights or we fight in the wrong ways. And if you don't believe me, go open Instagram, go open Facebook, go open TikTok, go open Twitter, find any post that deals with anything religious. And just look at the insane amount of arguments and fights that you'll find in the comment section. Or even just think about the amount of companies that Christians have told other Christians that they need to boycott because their beliefs differ from ours in some way or because someone decided to take the word Christmas off a coffee cup. And I get that this is how the world fights against us. Right? Our culture constantly looks for ways that it can attack and cancel Christianity however it can. And people will always find reasons to fight, debate, and argue with us. But we can't respond to our world the way it responds to us. See, Paul talked about it this way in Romans 12, 17 through 21. He said, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, fighting against our culture doesn't mean that we become these holy crusaders who conquered the political and social landscapes of America. We fight against our environment by being obedient to God. We fight against sin by making disciples. We fight against the evil in the world by sharing the gospel of Jesus and teaching people to follow all of his commands. And when the world chooses to attack and retaliate against us, we share the grace of Jesus with them. And I love that Paul equates this with dumping burning coals on someone's head because one, it's just kind of a funny image to think of someone reaching into a Weber and just... But scholars refer to this as the idea of burning conviction. And what they're talking about is that when we choose to overcome evil with good, people don't know how to think about that. And they don't understand why we would respond that way. And so they're gonna ask us, dude, why would you do that? And it actually gives us the opportunity to not only glorify God, but lead people to Jesus and help grow his kingdom. 
So do you see that God uses the hostility of the world to lead to conviction and growth when we respond with grace? He turns the hostile into the hospitable. So don't overcome evil with evil. Don't fight against the world the way that it fights against us. Overcome evil with good. Live obediently to God. Share the gospel. Make disciples. And when the world attacks us, share the grace of Jesus. I mean, if you'll do that, you will be blown away at how much, you would, how much the church can thrive in this world. Look at our next verses with me. These are verses 13 through 18. It said, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the fire, into the blazing furnace, God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So set the scene. You're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and you're faced with an angry Nebuchadnezzar and a fiery furnace. And so not only is the king threatening you, but talk about the immense pressure of standing in front of the instrument of your death if you choose to not worship this idol. But I love the response that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have. They don't beg for their life. They don't defend their actions. They just remain obedient to God. And in the face of the furnace, they depend on God to deliver them, regardless of whether he does it or not. Because they knew that ultimately, if God's people were faithful to him, that he would sustain Israel through this exile, regardless of whether he saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you need to understand why Israel found themselves in Babylon in the first place to understand the significance of this. See, Israel found themselves in exile because they broke the covenant with God through idolatry and simple living. So not only were they living in these ridiculously evil ways, but they felt that they didn't need God anymore, that they could be independent from him, and so they turned away from him. And so when God stopped protecting Israel, Babylon captured Israel. But now you have these three Israelites who find themselves in a hostile world facing a tyrant king, and they choose to do the opposite. Not only are they obedient to God, but they depend on him entirely for deliverance in this moment. And look what happens in verses 19 through 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. There's no way that anybody could possibly survive the fire of this furnace. But God turns the hostile into the hospitable. And so to the amazement of Nebuchadnezzar, when he looks into this furnace, he sees Daniel's friends unbound, they're free, and they're just walking around alive. See, because they had been faithful to God and dependent on him, God chose to deliver them from this, uh, the furnace. But I also want you to not miss this detail. There are four people in that fire. And Nebuchadnezzar says that he describes the fourth man as someone who looked like the son of a God. It's widely accepted by scholars that this fourth man is none other than Jesus himself. And so in the midst 
of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's greatest trial, Jesus is with them through it all. And see, that same thing is true for us. That yes, we're gonna go through suffering and persecution and trials and trouble, but in the midst of these things, that God is faithful to deliver us when we depend on him. And that doesn't always mean that God saves us from something or removes us from the situation like he does with the fiery furnace. But what it does mean is that God is with us every step of the way, walking with us and helping us through the darkest moments in our lives. It's why David in Psalm 23 refers to him as the shepherd who walks through the valley, that God is with us. And ultimately, man, we get to have the hope and the promise and peace of eternity with Jesus when he returns later. And so in the face of the furnace, don't worry. You can have confidence that if you're dependent on God, he will carry you through whatever situation you face because he turns the hostile into the hospitable. As a result of what happens here at this furnace in this story, Israel actually is able to freely worship God in all of Babylon for the rest of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And God still does stuff like this to this day. Think about all that God has done up to this point, how he has sustained his church. And so for us, man, in the face of a hostile environment, when we think about how evil our world and our society is becoming, we can be confident and have faith that God will sustain us and help us through it. Because for 2,000 years, God has been sustaining and growing his church through the most hostile environments. And so we can have confidence that God is with us do all of it. So, how do we respond this morning? Looking to the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, be faithful to God despite the circumstances around us. In the midst of a hostile world, live obediently to Jesus. Choose to share the gospel and make disciples. And when the world attacks you, share the grace of Jesus with the world. But ultimately, depend on God to sustain you and go you, grow you through whatever trial you walk through. Man, if we will do that, we won't just survive in this world, but we'll thrive in it. You know, in 2019, there was a documentary released called Sheep Among Wolves. And if you've never seen it, I would highly encourage you to go watch it. It's online, it's free. Just type in Sheep Among Wolves and you'll find it. But this video, it documents the story of what started the underground church movement in the nation of Iran. And if you didn't know, Iran is the eighth most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. They have a zero tolerance religion policy. And so what that means is that if you denounce the national faith of Islam, not only will your friends and family disown you, but more than likely you will either be imprisoned or killed. But this movement started, a couple of missionaries went over to Iran and in secret, they started sharing the gospel and making disciples. And what they did was they got a home and they started just having secret church services in this home. And what ended up happening was this movement, this small, tiny movement quickly exploded and it's led to thousands and thousands of people following Jesus in Iran in a sprawling network of over 300 underground churches. These people don't have fancy buildings. They don't have laws or a government that protects them. They face death every single day. And yet God's church is thriving. But this kind of movement shouldn't shock us. The church has always thrived best in the very environments that it was supposed to fail. Think about Rome persecuting Christians 2,000 years ago. In the middle of that persecution, the church grew so much that it eventually became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And today, the greatest Christian movements in the world are taking place in the Middle East and Southeast Asia where Christianity is prohibited and people are killed for their faith. But God turns the hostile into the hospitable. And so if that's how the church can grow in the most hostile environments, imagine what he can do here at Karis City. We have an opportunity to not just survive in our world, but to thrive in a hostile environment. So live obediently to God, share the gospel, make disciples, share the grace of Jesus, but depend entirely on God to sustain and grow you 
and his church. And man, if we will do that, you will be blown away by how God doesn't have a single limit of what he'll do in and through this church. So ultimately, the question we have to ask ourselves today is, what kind of church will we be? Will we be a church that just survives? Or will we be a church that thrives in a hostile world? Let's pray.